May 23rd, 1918. Joseph and Catherine Maggio were sleeping comfortably in their home when someone entered, slit their throats with a straight razor, and clubbed their heads with an axe. The papers of the time dubbed him the Axe Man. June 27th, 1918. Harriet Lowe and Louis Bessemer are assaulted in Louis's grocery store. Louis is smashed above the ear with a hatchet, and Lowe's face is sliced. A month and a half later, Lowe would die due to complications from corrective surgery to fix a partially paralyzed face caused by the attack. New Orleans was on edge. A killer or killers was roaming the city, dealing out almost supernatural violence. The police were stumped. In none of the cases was there any sign of forced entry. Some surmised a vengeful spirit was haunting New Orleans. Police would later discover the true reason. The Axeman was chiseling small holes in people's doors, just big enough for a small person to fit through. The Axeman would go on to attack nine more people, killing two. His terrible record as a murderer was overshadowed only by his love of jazz. In March 1919, the Axeman would send a letter that would drive New Orleans into a jazz-fueled panic. Hot as hell, March 13th, 1919. Esteemed mortal of New Orleans, the Axeman. They have never caught me, and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible. Even as the ether that surrounds your earth, I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axe Man. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know who they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe, besmeared with blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rile me. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as to not only amuse me, but his satanic majesty Francis Joseph, etc. But tell them to beware. Let them not try to discover what I am, for it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the Axe Man. I don't think there is any need of such a warning, for I feel sure the police will always dodge me as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, you Orleanians think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am, but I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, and the worst. For I am in a close relationship with the Angel of Death. Now, to be exact, at 12.15 earthly time on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time that I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well then, so much the better for you people. One thing is certain and that is that some of your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, it is about time I leave your earthly home. I will cease my discourse, hoping that thou wilt publish this, that it may go well with thee. I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that ever existed, either in fact or realm of fancy. The Axe Man. March 19th, 1919. New Orleans was filled with jazz. Dance halls were jam-packed with revelers. The streets were filled with musicians. People had bands playing at their homes, and every amateur accordion player was soaking up the limelight afforded to them by this foreboding letter. No one was attacked on March 19th. October 27, 1919. Mike Pepitone is lounging at home when he is brutally beaten in the head with an axe. He will not survive. Pepitone is the last known victim of the Axeman. 
Over the following years, many attempts have been made to identify this almost supernatural killer. Why did he kill? How did he move so stealthily through people's houses? Some say he was a phantom, able to shrink himself down to fit through the holes he chiseled in victims' doors and then grow back to regular size to attack. Others claim he may have been Jack the Ripper, just 30 years removed from his grisly crime spree in London. Far more claim he was possibly Frank Doc Mumphrey, a low-level mafioso who also went by the name Joseph Monfrey. As a low-level criminal, and not a very good one, Monfrey was constantly being caught committing crimes. In 1919, he dynamited a store, which I guess was way more common in the early 1900s, and received prison time. All of the Axeman attacks line up with periods of time when Monfrey was supposedly not in prison. This is of course a point of contention, as some claim Monfrey never actually existed. Whatever the cause for these attacks, to this day they remain unsolved cold cases. The killings stopped just as mysteriously as they began. New Orleans today remains a city almost on the edge of what's real, what's supernatural, and what's unsolved. If you were to die, right now, who would know? We all assume that our passing will be mourned. We assume that well-wishers and family will fill a church with their sadness, and a grand eulogy will be read for someone who went too soon. What if none of that happened? What if you died and no one knew? What if your body just sat and people assumed you hadn't contacted them because you were out living your best life? In this age of internet and impersonal contact, it could be very likely. In fact, it's already happened. January 25th, 2006. The tenant in the apartment above the Wood Green Shopping City, located in Wood Green, London, hadn't been paying their rent. After almost two years, the outstanding debt was topping out at 2,400 British pounds. The owner of the apartment block, the Metropolitan Housing Society, had decided enough was enough. Management forced open the door to the apartment and were greeted with a grisly sight. A mostly skeletal corpse sitting in front of a still playing TV, surrounded by neatly wrapped Christmas presents. This was Joyce Vincent, and at that point, she'd been dead almost three years. How does someone living in a noisy, busy council apartment go without even a check-in for three years? How does no one notice? The smell of her body decomposing was rationalized away by tenants as the smell of nearby garbage cans. The apartments, as mentioned before, were noisy, so no one paid any attention to a TV that had been playing loudly the whole time. Joyce Vincent was the last person you would expect to go unnoticed. She was a friend to many in the music industry and had even met Nelson Mandela at Wembley Stadium, backstage for the international tribute for a free South Africa concert. By all accounts, she had a wide social circle. What changed? In 2001, Vincent left her job of four years. Shortly after that, she spent time in a domestic abuse shelter in Herringay, London, working as janitorial staff in a hotel. February 2003, Vincent was moved to the apartment where she would die. London's social safety net paid half her rent, leading the property owners to believe she was still alive. When questioned further about how Vincent could go unnoticed for so long, the Metropolitan Housing Trust pointed out that in the almost three years since her death, no one inquired about Vincent, neither her neighbors nor any family. You might assume that given the state of her end, that Vincent had no family. Vincent actually had four sisters, who had essentially raised her after her mother's death. They had hired a private investigator to try and find her. The PI found her home and her sisters began sending letters. After receiving no response, they assumed Vincent no longer wanted them in her life. Vincent was allegedly dating at the time, but to this day, no one can find her boyfriend. The Glasgow Herald reported this on her story. Her friends noted her as someone who fled at signs of trouble, who walked out of jobs if she clashed with a colleague, and who moved from one flat to the next all over London. She didn't answer the phone to her sister and didn't appear to have her own circle of friends, instead relying on the company of relative strangers who came with the package of a new boyfriend, a colleague, or flatmate. Even though people repeatedly stated they assumed she had cut off contact, there was still the matter of the gifts wrapped in her apartment. For someone who was portrayed as unreachable, why would she be wrapping gifts? It has never emerged who the gifts were addressed to. Due to her advanced state of decomposition, Vincent's cause of death is unknown. Some point to a peptic ulcer that she was treated for earlier in the month, while others say it was caused by an asthma attack. 
To this day, her cause of death remains unknown. The mystery I'm posing to you, viewer, isn't whether or not Joyce Vincent was the victim of foul play. The question is really, how can someone die and go completely unnoticed? How does a sister, a friend, a colleague just step out of everyone's life? She wasn't discovered by a worried family member or a distraught partner. The only reason Joyce Vincent was found was because she owed someone money. Think about that. Michael Taylor, 31 years old, father to five children and husband to Christine. It was 1974 and Michael was living what appeared to be an idyllic life. The Taylor family lived in a small home in Osset, West Yorkshire. Neighbors described Michael as mild-mannered and generally kind. Occasionally, Michael would suffer from depressive episodes. He would become withdrawn and refuse to interact with family and friends. Family would later say a back injury earlier in life, which caused issues with Michael finding full-time employment, was to blame. Nevertheless, he was by all accounts a caring father and husband. The Taylor family was not devout. They lived within a few miles of multiple churches, but never really found the time to attend. In a highly religious town like Osset, this behavior just couldn't stand. A friend of Michael's, who had decided his depression was caused by spiritual forces, convinced him to start attending a weekly prayer meeting. The group was run by one Marie Robinson. Her soft-spoken form of old-time religion seemed to appeal to Michael. At least that's what everyone thought in the beginning. As time went on, Michael began spending a ludicrous amount of time with Marie. At first, he just threw himself into the prayer group, going to every meeting and all functions they held. He quickly fell deeper into Marie's teachings, attending meetings where group members were exercised and demons were cast out with what they called the power of God. Marie began offering private meetings to Michael. During these meetings, Michael and Marie would sit across from each other and make the sign of the cross over and over, sometimes for eight plus hours. They believed that doing this would nullify the evil power of the full moon. To the other members of the prayer group, it was clear that Michael had fallen head over heels in love with Marie. His time away at church and his private prayer meetings were starting to be noticed in his home life. When he wasn't around Marie, he became withdrawn, slipping into deep depressions. He had become sullen and argumentative, and would lash out at his family. Christine had a suspicion that the prayer group wasn't doing Michael any favors, and that his private meetings with Marie may have been less than pious. During the next prayer meeting they attended, Christine openly confronted Michael about his time with Marie. When he was confronted, something broke inside of Michael Taylor. He stood up, and instead of addressing his wife, he began to attack Marie both verbally and physically. He was still shouting at her in tongues when the rest of the congregation physically restrained him. I suddenly glanced at Mike and his whole features changed. He looked almost bestial. He kept looking at me and there was a really wild look in his eyes. I started screaming at him out of fear. I started speaking in tongues. Mike also screamed at me in tongues. I was on the verge of death and I seemed to come to my senses. I knew that only the name of Jesus would save me, and I just started saying over and over again, Jesus. When Chris, Christine, heard me calling on the name of Jesus, she started saying it too, and I believe firmly that it was only by calling on his name that I was not killed. Michael claimed he had no memory of this happening. At the next meeting, he would receive full absolution from Marie. Still, his outburst had not gone unnoticed. People were talking, and none of it was good. A local vicar called on a group of ministers and declared that Michael was currently suffering from demonic possession and would need an exorcism. October 5, 1974, Father Peter Vincent and Reverend Raymond Smith, accompanied by the prayer group, met with Michael at the St. Thomas's Church in Gobber. Over the next eight hours, they would perform the sacred rite of exorcism. Michael began thrashing, convulsing, and spitting, and had to be tied to the floor of the church. A crucifix was jammed into his mouth, and he was completely soaked with holy water. At 8 a.m. October 6th, the priests couldn't continue. They were exhausted, and by their admission, had cast out more than 40 demons from Michael. The priests said the exorcism would have to be finished at a later date, and advised Michael not to worry. They had only left but three demons to be exorcised, the demons of murder, madness, and violence. 
Michael and Christine were told to go home and prepare for part two of the exorcism. At 9.45 a.m., just an hour and 45 minutes after they left, police patrolling the area where the Taylors lived discovered a gruesome sight. A man shambling through the streets, completely naked, covered with blood. It was, of course, no other than Michael Taylor. The officer that had found Taylor rushed to his home, only to find police officers were already there. Neighbors had heard noises, and the police were called. The officer approached the house, but was waved off by an exiting criminal inspector. Upon entering the house, officers were met with what they would later call the worst crime scene they've ever worked. Michael had brutally attacked Christine, removing her eyes and tongue, before setting about trying to rip the skin off of her skull. He then strangled the family dog, ripped out its eyes, and tore it limb from limb, throwing them around the house. The house was covered wall to ceiling in blood. Michael, who was at that time receiving care in a nearby hospital, was arrested. At trial, the defense attorney laid blame squarely at the feet of the prayer group and the priests who did the exorcism. He stated that the group exacerbated an already fragile mind. He cast doubt on the possession theory by calling it neurotics, feeding neuroses, to a neurotic. Michael was acquitted by reason of insanity. He received psychiatric care for four years and was released back into the public. So what happened? Was Michael Taylor possessed? Or was he just simply the victim of a fringe religious group? Dan Cooper enters the Portland International Airport and purchases a one-way ticket to Seattle. Smartly dressed in a suit and tie, Cooper raises no suspicions. Shortly after takeoff, flight attendant Florence Schaffner approaches Cooper to ask if he needs anything. She is handed a note. She thinks he's being fresh and has passed her a phone number. She pockets the note and continues on with her job. Later, as she passes Cooper again, he beckons her closer. He tells her that she would be wise to read the note because he has a bomb in his suitcase. Schaffner walks to the back of the plane and reads the note. The note itself was then returned to Cooper. The exact wording of the demands is lost to time, but the gist of it is this. I have a bomb, I want $200,000 in cash, and two parachutes. Pilot William Scott notified air traffic control. Air traffic control notified Seattle police. Seattle police notified the FBI, and the FBI contacted the president of the airline, Donald Nyrop. Nyrop was stunned. He saw a disaster in the making and asked that Cooper's demands be met. Schaffner, meanwhile, went to sit with Cooper. He cracked his briefcase to reveal what appeared to be two sticks of dynamite, wired and ready to go. Cooper instructed the crew to keep the plane in the air until his parachutes and cash were ready. Cooper was, of course, not the only person on this flight. It was the day before Thanksgiving and travelers from all over the U.S. were on board. Holiday travel then was as popular as it is now. The pilot called over the intercom that due to mechanical issues, the plane would have to circle before landing. No one other than the crew knew what Cooper was doing. Dan Cooper held all the cards. He had a bomb in a briefcase and a score of potential victims. On the ground, FBI agents were scurrying to meet Cooper's demands. He wanted the money in 20s only with non-sequential serial numbers. Smaller bills would mess up the weight ratio he required for his upcoming jump. The money was easy enough. Local banks were more than happy to assist the FBI. Parachutes were a whole different problem. Cooper refused military parachutes and asked that he be provided civilian chutes. The FBI isn't normally in the business of stockpiling civilian gear, so they had to ask the owner of a nearby skydiving school. After his initial reluctance, he agreed to sell the FBI four parachutes. An airport employee met the plane on the tarmac. The lights had been dimmed. When Cooper received his ransom, he released the 36 passengers on board, along with Florence Schaffner. Stewardess Tina Mucklow remained on the plane, along with the cockpit crew. A Federal Aviation Administration official asked Cooper if he could board. He wanted to have a frank talk with Cooper about the penalties of air piracy. His request was denied. The plane was going back up in the air, and no one was going to stop it. Cooper asked Mucklow to read him the instructions for the aft stairs. 
She stated she didn't think that the stairs could be open mid-flight. Cooper simply told her she was thinking wrong. Dan Cooper knew a thing or two about airplanes. He understood that the cabin could be depressurized at less than 10,000 feet without a risk to the crew. He knew that traveling at 150 knots would be an acceptable speed for a skydive. He knew the range of a Boeing 727. He had asked the pilots to take him to Mexico City, though he knew that 52,000 gallons of fuel wouldn't get him there. A stop in Reno, Nevada for fuel was negotiated. Shortly after takeoff, Cooper ordered the crew to get in the cockpit and stay there. A red light came on shortly after. The door had been opened and the aft stairs were down. The captain called over the intercom to ask if Cooper needed anything. He received a loud no. This was the last time anyone spoke to Dan Cooper. After arriving in Reno, the crew emerged from the cockpit. Dan Cooper was gone, along with the money and his personal belongings, including his briefcase. The only thing left behind was the extra parachute. The FBI was stumped. Over the coming weeks, the areas on the flight path were searched, searched again, and searched some more. Authorities began searching criminal records for a Dan Cooper. During the search, they ran across a similar name. The name was leaked to the press. And due to a miscommunication, a reporter was leaked the information about a suspect living in Portland. Though this suspect was quickly cleared, his name would go on to be used for all investigations until present day. D. B. Cooper. So what happened? Did Dan Cooper float off into the sunset with his $200,000? Did he miss time the jump and end up hitting the ground? Is there a well-dressed skeleton in the woods of the Pacific Northwest? There have been few clues. Most leads only end up creating dead ends. 1980. Bundles of 20s with serial numbers matching that of Cooper's ransom are found in Washington. A search was undertaken, but the eruption of Mount St. Helens just a few months later destroyed any further evidence. 2011. Marla Cooper claims her uncle L.D. Cooper is the hijacker. She claims that she overheard her uncle telling family members that their worries were over because he had hijacked a plane. Later, she would tell authorities that LD actually lost all of the money while skydiving from the plane. One of the flight attendants stated that LD Cooper did bear a resemblance to the hijacker. The FBI have investigated and declared it a dead end. 2016. The FBI announces that no more resources will go into actively investigating the DB Cooper case. Most FBI agents who have worked the case will tell you the same thing. DB Cooper didn't survive his jump. 2021 is the 50th anniversary of Dan Cooper's audacious act of air piracy. After all of this time, no one is any closer to catching Dan Cooper. So what do you think? Did Cooper get away with it? Or is there a treasure waiting to be found in the Pacific Northwest? November 29th, 1970. Bergen, Norway. A man and his daughters are hiking through the foothills of the north face of the mountain Ulriken. This area is commonly known as Isdalen, or Ice Valley. Locals also call it Death Valley, for its reputation as a spot with many hiking injuries and accidents. There was a smell of something burning in the air. One of the man's daughters went off in search of the source. What she found would kick off one of the biggest Cold War mysteries in Norway's history. A woman's body badly burnt, was laying in the underbrush. The man and his daughters quickly left to contact police. The police arrived on scene and noted a few observations. The front of the body was burned so badly it was not recognizable. Near the body, along with personal effects, were two items of note, a plastic passport holder and a matchbox. Underneath the body was a fur hat. This hat would later test positive for traces of gasoline. Three days later, police would find two suitcases belonging to the woman at the Bergen railway station. In the lining of one of the suitcases, 100 Deutschmarks were found. The mystery only deepened when they also found Norwegian kroner, Belgian, British, and Swiss coins, along with various maps and numerous notepads filled with locations. An autopsy revealed that the woman had died due to incapacitation caused by an overdose of sleeping pills along with carbon monoxide poisoning. 
Soot found in her lungs would suggest that she had been alive while on fire. The back of her neck was bruised, indicating that she might have been struck there. Her stomach was pumped, and the remains of 50 to 70 sleeping pills were found. So with all this information, why haven't I given you the woman's name? Authorities to this day don't know what it really is. After holding a press conference to get more information about the woman, the woman described was of a slight build, with brown hair often tied into a ponytail. She had gold crowns on her teeth, which are uncommon in most western countries. A hotel in Birkin contacted police to let them know that the woman described had stayed there. They said that she had been very private and rarely left her room. She had meticulously written down every place she had visited. A search of hotels in those areas brought the police to a strange conclusion. The woman had been using at least eight different identities. She had provided passports at all of these locations, each different. The only consistent detail she had provided was that she was Belgian, although the forms she filled out were in either German or French. People who had seen her at hotels around Bergen said they had heard her speaking to someone in German. Witnesses also noted her propensity for wearing wigs. The police had a composite sketch drawn, and it was sent to Interpol. After having no luck identifying her, the case was closed. The police had ruled that the woman, now being called the Isdal woman, had committed suicide. She was buried in Molindal Cemetery. Obviously, something wasn't right. The multiple identities, the list of locations, the wigs? Well, this was during the height of the Cold War. Spying was never out of the question. Years later, when Norwegian Armed Forces documents became declassified, they were checked against the Isdal woman's notes. Her movements seemed to line up suspiciously well to areas where top-secret trials were being conducted on Norway's Penguin missile. In 1991, a taxi driver who asked to remain anonymous came forward to tell authorities that he had picked up the woman from the Bergen Hotel where she had last been seen. He stated that she had been accompanied by an unidentified man on the way to Bergen train station. In 2005, a man came forward who claimed to have seen the Isdal woman hiking roughly five days before her body was found. He stated that she was being flanked by two men. He said she looked like she wanted to say something, but didn't. He would go on to say that her attitude seemed resigned. Who were these men? Were they taking her out to the foothills to get rid of her? In 2016, the case was reopened. It remains open to this day. In 2017, a stable isotope analysis of the woman's teeth would indicate that she had most likely been born in Germany. Today, nearly 51 years after her death, we are still no closer to knowing who she really was. What do you think? Was she an unfortunate suicide, or possibly a spy on the run? May 1988, Fall River, Massachusetts. Deborah Medeiros tells her mother Olivia that she's going to visit her boyfriend in New Bedford, Massachusetts. A lifelong drug user who has never moved out of her mother's house, Olivia is no stranger to Deborah leaving for long stretches of time. Several days later, Olivia received a call from Deborah's boyfriend. They had gotten into a fight on the night of May 27th, and he hadn't seen her since. He thought she was back at home with her mother. July 3rd, 1988, Freetown, Massachusetts. Deborah's body is found off the side of Highway 140. A total of nine victims will be found on highways near or in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Some, like Deborah, are found in groups. In her case, she was one of five bodies found within six miles of each other. There was a killer in New Bedford. The search for this serial killer will span years. It will take detectives to different countries and their own backyards. This is the story of the New Bedford killer. Deborah Medeiros, Nancy Piva, Deborah Greenlow DeMio, Don Mendez, Deborah Lynn McConnell. These first five women were all found along Route 140 or I-195. Highways around New Bedford, Freetown, and Dartmouth, Massachusetts. They had been strangled. Ligature marks and bruises on their necks were found. These were not kind deaths. 
Witnesses have placed them all in New Bedford before their disappearances. Police were shocked. Five bodies in such a relatively short time frame is unthinkable. Police began focusing their efforts on New Bedford, particularly the Weld Square area. Known to locals as a gathering point for the city's sex workers and those struggling with addiction, someone had to know something. The connections were found immediately. Nearly all these women knew each other or had professional relationships. They all tied back to Weld Square. All five women were either struggling with addiction, sex workers, or both. Some said the police were kicking the can down the road, putting less energy into the cases since it involved addicts and sex workers. Serial killers prey on the helpless, the invisible people. They do this because they know the police won't investigate. The police don't often attribute humanity to these victims. Disappearances are shrugged off because, hey, they were in the wrong line of work. How many of these women would still be alive today if police had checked sooner? December 10th, 1988, Dartmouth, Massachusetts. A sixth body is found in a gravel pit just off the highway. This is Rochelle Clifford do Piarala. She has been beaten to death. March 26, 1989, Freetown, Massachusetts. A seventh body is found dumped off along Route 140. This is Robin Rhodes. She has been strangled. March 31st, 1989, Westport, Massachusetts. An eighth body is found alongside Route 88. This is Mary Rose Santos. She has been strangled. April 24th, 1989, Marion, Massachusetts. The final definitive victim of a monster now known as the New Bedford Highway Killer is found alongside I-195. This is Sandra Botello. She has been strangled. May 1989, Weld Square. A picture is making the rounds at the square. Detective Lorraine Forrester is asking questions. The photo she has is of Anthony de Grazia. He is a 26-year-old construction worker and frequent visitor to Weld Square. Someone here knows de Grazia. Margaret Medeiros has shown the photo. She states that the man in the photo looks similar to a man who had previously attacked and tried to strangle her. This is the information Forrester is looking for. Madero is brought to a secret grand jury. She testifies that de Grazia looks like the man who attacked her. De Grazia is arrested and questioned, but never indicted by the secret grand jury. Later, District Attorney Ronald Pena asks that a warrant be placed for de Grazia, accusing him of 17 alleged attempted rapes and assaults on sex workers in the Weld Square area. De Grazia is notified of the warrant and surrenders himself. He will spend the next 13 months in jail before being released due to lack of evidence. August 1990, New Bedford, Massachusetts. Attorney Kenneth Ponte is indicted by a grand jury in the murder of Rochelle Clifford de Piarala. Ponte, then practicing as a lawyer, had a sordid past. District Attorney Ronald Pena suggested that Ponte had beaten Do Piarala to death over a blackmail plot. Ponte had previously represented Do Piarala in April 1988, shortly before her disappearance. In September of 1988, Ponte had moved to Florida, just three months before her body would be found. Ponte was arraigned on murder charges in September 1988. He entered a plea of absolutely not guilty and posted a $50,000 bond. July 17, 1990. One month after his release, Anthony de Grazia is found dead in his ex-girlfriend's parents' backyard. He is laying face down under their picnic table. No evidence has ever been found that could tie de Grazia to any of the crimes he was accused of. 1991. All charges are dropped against Ponte due to lack of evidence. The case had gone cold. Meanwhile, in Lisbon, Portugal, a strange pattern is emerging. Someone was killing sex workers. Five alone had been killed between 1992 and 1993. The killer had been dubbed the Lisbon Ripper due to his M.O. matching that of Jack the Ripper. He was disemboweling prostitutes. The Portuguese Policia Judiciária sent two detectives to New Bedford. New Bedford has a large Portuguese population, and they believe the highway killer and the Lisbon Ripper were one and the same. 
The FBI also sent two of its agents to Lisbon in an information-sharing capacity. The killings in Lisbon were also linked to killings in Belgium, the Netherlands, Denmark, and the Czech Republic between 1993 and 1997. The prevailing theory was that the Lisbon Ripper slash New Bedford Highway Killer was a long-haul trucker. Nothing came of the investigation at that time. 2007. Daniel Tavares Jr. is in prison for the murder of his mother. He sent a threatening letter to prison staff claiming to be the New Bedford Highway Killer. Upon investigation, the body of Gail Botello, who disappeared in 1988 from New Bedford, is found buried under a tree in his former backyard. He has not admitted to any further killings. May 2009. Kenneth Ponty's front driveway is dug up by police. Nothing is found. July 27th, 2010. The only suspect ever charged in connection with the serial highway killings in Massachusetts has died. Kenneth Ponty is found dead in his new Bedford home. Foul play is not suspected. 2011. A 21-year-old man named Joel applied to participate in a Portuguese reality show called Secret Story. In the show, contestants try to guess each other's secrets while concealing their own. Joel's secret was that his father, José Pedro Guedes, was the Lisbon Ripper. Guedes was arrested and confessed to three of the Lisbon Ripper murders. He could not be prosecuted due to the Portuguese statute of limitations. Guedes also resided in Germany in the early 90s, around the same time as the other murders attributed to the Lisbon Ripper. Currently unknown if Guedes ever lived in the United States. So what do you think? We have a range of suspects, but nothing concrete. Two of the suspects are long dead. One's in Portugal, and the other's in prison. Is it one of them, or is it someone no one has ever considered? Let me... Henrik Siviak, 46 years old. An immigrant from Poland, born in Krakow in 1955. Siviak worked as an inspector for Polish state railways. He was married with two children, a perfectly unassuming man. In 2000, he was laid off and, finding a silver lining in the situation, took it as an opportunity to visit his sister Lucina, who had been living in Queens. He was not allowed to work in the U.S. He did not have a work visa, but still found steady work. The money he made was sent back to his family in Poland. He hoped that the money he was sending back would help him build a new home for his family when he returned. Siviak had trouble learning English. He attended classes and watched American TV with his sister, but he struggled. Lucina was concerned. New York was a big place and an inability to communicate could be dangerous. Misunderstandings could balloon out of control due to the language barrier. She expressed her concern to him. This is what she would later tell the Associated Press. I told him the city was a dangerous place, but he didn't believe it. And perhaps because he liked living there so much. September 11th, 2001. A cool morning like any other. This tranquil scene was about to be shattered by the most violent act of terrorism in American history. Siviak witnessed a plane fly into one of the towers. He later got news that the construction site he was working at had been shut down. He could not wait for it to open back up. He needed something and he needed it fast. He checked Novi Zhinyak, a Polish newspaper, and saw that Pathmark, a supermarket in Brooklyn, was hiring overnight janitorial staff. He went to an employment agency that served the Polish community for help with the application. She was distraught because her husband worked at the World Trade Center and had not contacted her. She would later find out he had died in the attacks. Siviak could start the new job that night. He called his wife to let her know he was okay. Her warning to him contained a grim hint of what was to come. Don't leave tonight, because it, it can be dangerous in New York. Siviak was undeterred. He had never been in the neighborhood where the pathmark was, but he got directions from his landlady. He was supposed to take the A train to the Utica Avenue station. 
according to the landlady, that would put him on the same street as Pathmark. She unfortunately did not ask him the address. If she had, she would have known that Pathmark was actually three miles south of where he would disembark the subway. New York was on edge. It had just suffered the worst terror attack in US history. Tensions were the highest they've ever been. Siviak's landlady told him to stay home. She explained that the neighborhood he was going to was dangerous. Siviak disregarded her and got dressed. Camouflage pants, jacket, and black boots. He set out into a dark and very changed New York. Siviak got off the subway at Fulton Street and began walking. Passerbys recall seeing him. He continued walking and ended up going north instead of south. Had he gone south, he would have had a long, but potentially uneventful, walk to Pathmark. He walked into a part of the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood that police had called one of the city's most dangerous. Any other night, police would have been on patrol. There would have been eyes looking out for Henrik Suviak. This night, in the wake of the September 11th attacks, the streets were devoid of police presence. At approximately 11.40 p.m., people on the street heard a loud argument, punctuated with gunshots. A woman recalled hearing her doorbell a short time after, but was too afraid to answer the door. 911 was called. When they arrived, they found Henrik Siviak lying face down on the sidewalk. He had been shot in the lung. A bloody trail led from where he was shot to the front door of the house to the sidewalk where he met his end. Police response was almost non-existent. Normally, detectives and beat cops would be swarming the area, taking witness statements and processing the scene. Siviak was not afforded this small luxury. New York did not have time or the resources for one more life on a date that had taken so many. The investigation's start was rocky, but it continues to this day. The lead detective on the case has long since retired. The prevailing theory is that Siviak's inability to speak English may have led to his death. If he was approached and mugged, would he understand what the mugger was telling him? Did he think that he was just being approached by a person in need of help? We'll never know. Siviak's wife and sister have begun to lose hope that they'll see a resolution in the case. I think... The police have many, many cases, and maybe they'll never call me. I'm afraid this is forever. Other people believe that Siviak was killed due to how he looked, wearing camouflage with dark hair. Did a New Yorker shocked from the events of the day kill someone just because they looked and sounded different? We may never know what transpired on that lonely street. New York has been in mourning for those it lost ever since that day. Henrik Siviak is a footnote. The only recorded homicide in New York on September 11th, 2001. I'll leave you with a quote from Michael Wilson of the New York Times. To be the last man killed on September 11th is to be hopelessly anonymous. Quietly mourned while year after year the rest of the city looks towards lower Manhattan. No one reads his name into a microphone at a ceremony. No memorial marks the sidewalk where he fell with a bullet in his lung. What do you think? Was this a case of mistaken identity? Was it a hate crime? Was it perhaps a botched robbery? February 13th, 2017. 13-year-old Abigail Williams and 14-year-old Liberty German, known to their family and friends as Libby and Abby were two carefree teens. They were enjoying a hike through the woodlands of Deer Creek Township in Delphi, Indiana. As they walked across the Monin High Bridge over Deer Creek, Libby stopped to take a picture of Abby as she walked across the abandoned and damaged bridge. This was the last anyone would hear from Abigail and Liberty. Libby's grandfather was supposed to meet the girls at 3.15, when they were a no-show, the families of the girls began a search of the area. After a short search, the decision was made to contact law enforcement. The police arrived and searched the area, 
no trace of Libby or Abby was found. Police were optimistic and maintained that there was no foul play involved in the disappearance. Teen girls wander and the hope was that they would return soon. Valentine's Day, 2017. Abigail Williams and Liberty German's bodies are found half a mile from the bridge where their last photo was taken. The details of how they were murdered have not been released by authorities. The girls' phones were still with them. What was found on the phones would spark a manhunt that continues to this day. February 15th, 2017. A quick-thinking Libby seemingly snapped this photo. It shows a man, head down, walking towards the girls. Is this a photo of their killer? Many think so. February 22nd, 2017. Police release a voice recording of the suspect taken from Liberty's phone. During a news conference, Liberty is lauded for having the foresight to record the interaction with their killer. Police revealed that they had more evidence from the phone, but couldn't release it without jeopardizing their case moving forward. July 17, 2017. Police release a composite sketch of the suspect in the murders. This sketch is based off of descriptions given by witnesses who were on the same trails as the girls the day they disappeared. The sketch shows a man in his late 30s, early 40s, with a stocky build. This lines up with the photos pulled from Libby's phone. September 2017, Woodland Park, Colorado. Daniel Nations is arrested for terrorizing hikers with a hatchet. Police notice he has expired Indiana plates on his vehicle. Their curiosity peaked. They find that Nations has an outstanding warrant in Indiana for failing to register as a sex offender. In January of 2018, after being sentenced to probation for his crime in Colorado, he is transported to Indiana on his outstanding warrant. Police are quick to notice that Nations bore a striking resemblance to the sketch they had released. Nations remains the only named person of interest in the case. Shortly after he was extradited to Indiana, Indiana State Police have not cleared Nations, but declared, he's not someone we care a whole lot about at this time. April 22nd, 2019. Two years after the murders, police seem to be no closer to finding the killer. A news conference is held with new information. A new sketch is released of the killer. Police reveal that this sketch, released more than two years after the murders, is actually the first sketch they had drawn up of the killer. During the course of this investigation, we have concluded the first sketch released will become secondary as of today. The result of the new information and intelligence over time leads us to believe the sketch, which you will see shortly, is the person responsible for the murders of these two little girls. This one is radically different from the original sketch. Police place him between 18 and 40 years old and claim that he may look far younger than he actually is. They also release a new extended audio clip. Please keep in mind, the person talking is one person and is the person on the bridge with the girls. The clip seems to have two voices, but Indiana State Police insist that it's just one person. At the same conference, the first video of the suspect is released. This is the video that the still photos were taken from. It shows a man walking along the bridge behind Abby and Libby. The man has a stilted walk. Police say that this is due to the unevenness of the bridge. When you see the video, watch the, watch the person's mannerisms as they walk. Watch the mannerisms as he walks. 
Do you recognize the mannerisms as being someone that you might know? The deterioration has caused issues with the spacing between the ties. Police believe that the suspect had forced the girls down the hill near the bridge and murdered them. Police have his voice. They have his picture. They have a video of him. How has he not been caught? One investigator has revealed that the killer left several strange signatures at the kill site. Due to the secrecy of the case, these signatures have not been released to the public. Indiana State Police Superintendent Doug Carter, who's leading the case, recently told a podcast that the command down the hill was the voice of the devil coming through the killer. This case is confusing in a lot of ways. While we have video and audio, the police have actually released very little information. The cause of death is unknown. Only one suspect has been named. The police sat on the first sketch for over two years, releasing a sketch they knew was not accurate. What's going on in Indiana? Theories are everywhere. The Delphi Murders subreddit is home to almost 48,000 members, and theories are readily traded back and forth. With the lack of solid information from the police, the community around the murders is rife with conspiracy theories. What kind of game are police playing with this killer? Many statements made reference the killer being there or watching, and even once, directly to the killer, who may be in this room. April 19th, 2021. A new lead has recently been opened in the case. James Brian Chadwell II of Lafayette, Indiana, just 15 miles from where the girls were found was arrested after a missing nine-year-old girl was found injured in his basement. Police have said that there are several factors causing them to look at him as a suspect in the murders. Numerous astute observers have noticed similarity between Liberty German and an absolutely chilling tattoo on Chadwell's arm. While he's sitting in jail, the investigation continues. Are we alone in the universe? Recently declassified communications and videos are giving us an unprecedented look into how the government handles these sightings, but there is no definitive answer to the question. No matter how much grainy footage is released, we still don't know what might be in our skies. In 1979, Paul Benowitz was trying to solve this timeless question. He was living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and working as a scientist. On the cool and clear desert nights, he began seeing mysterious lights in the sky. He was living near the Kirtland Air Force Base and right across from the Monzano Storage Area, the U.S.'s largest nuclear storage facility. To him, the location of these nighttime visitors was not a coincidence. He began filming the lights in the sky. Subsequent theories state that Benowitz was probably seeing the first ever tests of unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs. Whatever he was filming, theories say the government needed him to stop. Benowitz was undeterred. In the years that followed, Benowitz would discover one of the biggest conspiracies in ufologist circles. The more Benowitz discovered, the farther he spiraled down into a dark and inescapable place. Was Paul Benevitz mad, or did he find something that was never meant to be found? The story goes that Benevitz had somehow accidentally tapped into an encoded communications line at the Kirtland base. He was receiving genuine coded messages. He was sure that the messages were extraterrestrial in origin. Benowitz soon received a top-secret communication. He never divulged where it came from, but it told him that there was a secret underground base in Dulce, New Mexico. In the halls of ufology, Dulce Base is a very real and very dangerous place. An underground joint base shared by extraterrestrials and the U.S. military. It's home to inhumane and cruel human experimentation. 
In the years since Benowitz's discovery, many people have come forward to claim that they have been in the Dulce base. Theories say Benowitz was being misdirected. His focus on Dulce pulled his attention away from Kirtland. Many believe that Air Force counterintelligence officer Richard Doty was the man who fed Benowitz the information about Dulce. Many believe that after Benowitz discovered the encoded communications at Kirtland, that Doty was put on him to make sure he believed he was dealing with aliens. It would have been a huge blow to Cold War America if Benowitz started leaking legitimate state secrets. It was much easier to just let Doty push Benowitz further into his alien theories. In 1988, Benowitz wrote a paper called Project Beta. It detailed how exactly to go about attacking and exposing Dulce Base. He took this information to the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, who brushed him off as a delusional paranoid. From 1979 through 2003, the alien visitations to Benowitz became more frequent and intense. He reported seeing orbs of light in his home. He repeatedly complained of daytime alien flybys. He would produce strange wounds on his body and claim that he was being injected in his sleep by aliens. None of the evidence has ever been corroborated by trusted witnesses. Benowitz couldn't handle the stress. He wasn't eating. He wasn't sleeping. Every day had become a fight for survival against an enemy that most people didn't even believe existed. Benowitz was committed to a mental institution no less than three times before 2003. He began correspondence with Krista Telton, an alleged alien abductee who believed her child was of half-alien ancestry. Her conversations with Benowitz and other alleged eyewitnesses were published in her book, The Benowitz Papers. This book claims that Dulce was very real. One witness stated it was his job to wrangle staff that wandered into the alien-run areas of the base. Whether or not Benowitz's deteriorating mental state was caused by clandestine government operations is still up for debate. We're stuck with many different theories. Some have gone full in on the government angle. They claim that agents went so far as to install artificial above-ground vents in Dulce to reinforce the idea that there was a massive base underneath the town. Some claim that everything that Benowitz found out about aliens is true and that the government had no hand in it. UFOlogist William Moore has admitted that during this time period, he was trying to push Benowitz into a mental breakdown by feeding him false information. Doty has also publicly stated that he fed incendiary information to Benowitz, but that he was not specifically singled out. He states that he was instructed by his higher-ups in the military to infiltrate gatherings of UFOlogists to spread false and misleading information. In 2003, after years of stress and pressure, Benowitz broke. June 23rd, he took his own life. Or did he? The life and even death of Paul Benowitz is shrouded in mystery. For every confirmed detail we have about his life, we have 10 to 20 theories. Some claim that Benowitz is still alive today, being held in Dulce Base, the place he helped expose to the ufologist community. What do you think? Was Paul Benowitz a victim of aliens or a clandestine government operation? It's really up to you to decide. March 8, 2008, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Joshua Maddox was living a fairly carefree life. He had just turned 18 and was looking to find work either writing or playing music. He did well in school and seemed to have a path figured out for himself. That morning, Joshua left his parents' home to take a walk and never came back. His father, Mike Maddox, reported him missing on March 13th. Joshua's parents considered the possibility that he had just outgrown them. Since he had recently come of age, they figured he may have just decided to get a jump start on his career, shedding off his parents in the process. They also had to consider his mental state. Just two years earlier, 
Joshua's older brother Zachary had taken his own life. With the anniversary just passed, Mike Maddox wondered if his son had gone on walkabout in remembrance of Zachary. After receiving no communication, Mike, along with Joshua's other family members, began searching campgrounds, homeless shelters, and bus stations searching for him. No one could believe that the quiet and untroubled Joshua had run afoul of anyone. Days turned to weeks, weeks turned to months, and finally, months turned to years. Mike Maddox never gave up hope. When he moved a few years after Joshua's disappearance, he didn't sell the home he had lived in with Josh, just in case he decided to come back. Kate Maddox, Joshua's sister, had hoped he had disappeared with purpose to start a band or write the next great American novel. Since Josh was 18, it's been reasonable to assume that he may have decided to leave town to start a new life. As one of his two older sisters, I've always chosen to believe that this was the case. I've expected Josh to return home to my father's house at any time, with a wife and small children, so that they can meet their grandparents and two aunts. Josh has always been known for his musical and literary talent, so maybe we would find him playing music with a band on tour or catch him writing successful novels under a pen name so that he could keep his preferred lifestyle of solitude in the woods. August 6, 2015. Chuck Murphy, a native of Colorado Springs, was sick of his cabin. It had sat vacant as a temporary storage unit since 2005. A builder by trade, Murphy wanted to develop the land so it could start making him money. Demolition began, and as an excavator smashed through the chimney of the cabin, it revealed a grisly and heartbreaking sight. A body was found, curled into the fetal position, its knees above its head, with a hand held over its mouth. The police were called, and with the help of the county coroner and dental records, the body was identified as Joshua Maddox. The cabin was just a fourth of a mile from Joshua's home. Who knew that finding the body would not be the end of this mystery? In fact, it felt very much like the beginning. An autopsy was performed, with the coroner finding no signs of trauma, no broken bones, and no bullet holes. No one knew how Joshua Maddox had died. For reasons that have never been explained, after Joshua went missing and during the extensive searches all over the city, no one had ever checked the cabin. Murphy, the owner of the cabin, almost never visited and said that during his visits he had never noticed anything strange. The only thing the coroner has said about the state Joshua was found in was that it was not an instant death. With no wounds or trauma, it initially appeared that Joshua had died of hypothermia. This is speculation, as no definitive cause of death has ever been released. The coroner declared that the death was accidental, and that it appeared that Joshua had tried to climb down the chimney and had gotten stuck. With no adjacent houses, no one would have heard him yelling for help. After seeing this statement, Chuck Murphy was incensed. He released his own statement, stating that he had installed a rebar reinforced grate over the top of the chimney to keep out pests. With the grate in place, Joshua could not have entered the chimney. The coroner fired back that the grate could have been rusted and that no one on site had actually seen it. Unsatisfied, Murphy let him know that the grate was removed during demolition but before the discovery of Joshua's body. Things simply weren't adding up. On top of the revelation that the chimney was blocked, the coroner also discovered that a large breakfast bar had been torn from the wall and placed over the fireplace. Murphy has stated that he did not move it. Who did? When found, Joshua was only wearing a thermal undershirt. His other clothes and his shoes were found neatly placed next to the chimney. After reopening the case and admitting that the pieces of the puzzle didn't fit exactly, the coroner would later go on to re-rule the death as an accident, insisting that Joshua tried to climb down the chimney. While this was happening, tips were pouring in. 
one of the tips came from a strange place. A Reddit post written by someone who claimed to have gone to school with Joshua. I went to high school with this skinny, dorky hippie named Andy who played guitar in a band. I was never good friends with him or anything, but a year or so after I graduated, one of my good friends, Josh, started hanging out with him and then went missing. The last I heard, Andy was telling another friend, Yeah, me and Josh have been spending a lot of time together. We're planning a trip to New Mexico. The Andy mentioned in the post is Andrew Newman. He did go to New Mexico in 2009, where he stabbed a disabled man that he lived with. He went on the run and was captured in Texas a few months later. After being detained, he admitted to the stabbing and to a robbery in Washington. He would then go on to claim that he had killed a woman in Taos, New Mexico and stuffed her body in a barrel. The police had already charged a suspect in that case and decided to charge them instead of Andrew. Joshua's friends had reportedly tried to get the police to investigate Andrew from the start, but were allegedly told that Joshua was probably alive and living elsewhere. People close to Andrew have reportedly heard him brag, I put Josh in a hole. He has never been investigated for the death of Joshua Maddox. The case remains to this day unsolved. So what do you think? Was Joshua Maddox murdered and stuffed in a chimney? Or was this a simple case of misadventure? November 5th, 1975. Travis Walton was working as a lumberjack in the Apache Sitgreaves National Forest. After a hard day at work, he loaded up in a truck with six of his co-workers and headed towards the nearest town, Snowflake, Arizona. As they drove on, with night settling in, they witnessed a saucer-shaped object just a hundred feet in front of them. The truck was stopped and, after an argument, Travis decided to approach the strange craft. As he got closer, he says a beam of light struck him and he blacked out. His friends, terrified at this development, left Travis where he lay and sped off into the night. Once they had gotten about a quarter of a mile away, they say they saw the alien craft zip skywards. They returned to look for Travis, but according to them, he was gone. Meanwhile, Travis claims he awoke in what he thought was a hospital. He looked up to the doctors working on him and realized they were short, bald, humanoid aliens. He says he fought with them for a time before they placed a plastic wrap over his face and things went dark again. Other times, when Travis tells this part of the story, he runs away from the aliens and gets into a control room where he claims that he was approached by a human wearing blue coveralls and a helmet. He explains that this strange person led him through the ship, showing off the hangars and other amenities, before bringing him back to an examination room where he's knocked unconscious by one of the earlier aliens. Travis's co-workers returned to town and spoke with authorities, who were initially skeptical. They believed that the six other workers had murdered Walton due to a disagreement earlier in the day. With no evidence supporting their claims, all they could do was work the investigation and wait. November 10th, 1975. Travis Walton states he woke up in the forest where he was abducted, his clothes on backwards. He states that he remembers seeing the craft close its doors and float into the distance. He wandered to a phone booth in Hever, Arizona, roughly 30 miles southwest of where he was taken. He claims the town was strangely, completely empty. He places a call to his brother-in-law on the payphone and is back at home within an hour. His attempts at recovering quietly at home were quickly thwarted. Travis Walton was on the lips of every UFO researcher and tabloid journalist in the country. A man has seemingly been taken for five days and returned. No one was going to leave Travis alone. He was immediately put on the defensive and given a lie detector test. He failed spectacularly. Some say this was due to the fresh trauma of being abducted, while others claim he had been hiding in the wilderness for five days 
and hadn't gotten his story straight just yet, he would go on to pass subsequent tests. Not everyone believed Travis. His most vocal detractor was ufologist Philip Klass. He noted that the sheriff that was familiar with the case stated that Walton, along with his mother and brother-in-law, were huge fans of alien media. He posited that just two weeks earlier, Walton had watched the UFO incident, a fictionalized portrayal of the abduction of Betty and Barney Hill. Details in Walton's stories allegedly closely matched what was shown in the film. According to Travis, the area where he was abducted began acting strangely. Ufologist and Walton claim, without concrete truth, that the trees in the area have begun growing faster. They claim that core samples have shown increased growth at least 15 years after Walton's abduction. Tests were allegedly done that show a chemical change in the soil in the area, and that tree trunks that faced the UFO reportedly had incredibly wide and elliptical rings in their cores. Walton has always maintained he was abducted. He thinks it wasn't on purpose, though. He believes that he wandered too close to aliens studying the environment and got accidentally knocked out by their tools. He thinks he might have been airlifted onto the ship to make sure he was okay. These days, the area where the event happened is a very different place than it was in 1975. In 2002, a wildfire completely destroyed the area. The logging road Travis and his friends were on that night has since been decommissioned by the Forest Service. In 1979, Travis wrote a book about his experiences called Fire in the Sky, which was adapted into a horror film in 1993. Travis never went back to logging and has spent the last 40 years touring the country giving talks at UFO conventions. He occasionally takes groups up to the area in the Apache Sitgreaves National Forest where something extraordinary, whether it was extraterrestrial or a hoax, happened all those years ago. So what do you think? Was Travis Walton abducted by aliens? Or maybe this whole thing is just a hoax between friends gone wrong? I'll leave it up to you. January 15th, 1947. Betty Bursinger was walking with her daughter in the Lamert Park neighborhood of Los Angeles. She saw what she would later describe as a discarded store mannequin. When she got closer, what she saw sent her and her daughter running for the nearest house to call the police. She had found the body of a young woman named Elizabeth Short. She can't be blamed for thinking she had found a mannequin. Short's body had been cut cleanly in half. The crime scene was horrific. Short's face had been sliced open from the corners of her mouth all the way to her ears. Pieces of her flesh had been removed in strips on her breasts and thighs. Her lower body was sitting on top of her neatly gathered intestines. She had been posed. Her lower half was placed a foot from her upper half, and her hands were over her head with her legs spread apart. While investigators worked the crime scene, they quickly discovered that Short had been completely drained of blood. Investigators only had to wonder a short time where it had gone. A cement sack full of blood was found near the body. Getting prints was impossible as Short's body had been thoroughly cleaned with gasoline. Short's body was taken for an autopsy the next day. Rather than shedding light on the strange state the body was left in, it only caused more questions. The bisection was professional, done using a technique called hemicorporectomy. There was no bruising near the incision, which suggests it was done post-mortem. The cuts on her face painted a grimmer picture. Those cuts, along with bruising around the scalp, indicated that she was alive when the cutting started. Her cause of death was determined to be hemorrhaging from the cuts on her face along with blows to the head. Meanwhile, in Boston, Massachusetts, Short's mother, Phoebe Short, received a phone call. 
She was told that her daughter had just won a beauty contest. She gave as many details about Short's life as she could to the people certifying the contest. After ringing out as much information as possible, they informed Short that her daughter had actually been murdered. These upstanding paragons of journalistic integrity were reporters from the Los Angeles Examiner. Some say the Examiner played a very big role in helping mishandle the Short case. They paid for her mother to fly to Los Angeles under the pretense of letting her speak to the police. When in fact, they kept her away from law enforcement to protect their exclusive. They further blew up the case by painting Elizabeth as an adventurous who was out wearing a tight skirt and a sheer blouse. They gave her an outsized nickname to fit their already crass and outsized characterization, the Black Dahlia. Or did they? Some are torn on the Black Dahlia moniker. Some sources claim it was coined by the newspapers of the time, while others claim it was a nickname given to her by friends due to her always wearing black. No matter who coined it, almost everyone agrees that the name comes from the 1946 film The Blue Dahlia. Whether it turned from blue to black due to Short's habit of wearing black, or even her hair color, remains unknown. The hunt was on in Los Angeles for a killer. January 21st, 1947. A call is made to the editor of the Examiner, James Richardson. The mysterious caller congratulated Richardson for his coverage of the Black Dahlia. He then told him that he would turn himself in, but only after allowing police to chase him a bit further. He then informed Richardson that he should expect some souvenirs of Beth Short in the mail. January 24th, 1947. A U.S. Postal Service worker finds a manila envelope addressed to the Los Angeles Examiner and other Los Angeles papers. The outside was emblazoned with a short message. Here is Dahlia's belongings, letter to follow. Inside the envelope there was Elizabeth's birth certificate, names written on pieces of paper, and an address book with Mark Hansen on the cover. The entire packet had been carefully cleaned with gasoline. No evidence was able to be pulled from the envelope. Same day, someone reported a suspicious handbag in suede shoe sitting on top of a garbage can just two miles from where Short's body was found. Police quickly went and took possession of the items but found that they too had been washed with gasoline. Police immediately zeroed in on Mark Hansen, the owner of the address book. He was an acquaintance of Short's in a way, as she had stayed at the house of one of his friends for a short while. Some say that he was the person who initially identified the shoe and handbag from the trash can. Short's former roommate attested that Short had denied Hansen's sexual advances. As police investigated Hansen, it became clear to them that he was not involved in the killing and he was subsequently cleared. Once it was all said and done, over 150 men were interviewed in the Black Dahlia case. Most names in the address book were checked and rechecked. No arrests were made. January 26, 1947. Another letter is sent to the examiner, which read, Here it is, turning in Wednesday, January 29th, 10 a.m. Had my fun at police, Black Dahlia Avenger. The letter had a location attached where the killer could be apprehended. The time came and went, and later the examiner would receive another letter. This one stated, Have changed my mind. You would not give me a square deal. Dahlia killing was justified. March 14th, 1947. A beach caretaker was cleaning the beach at Breeze Avenue, Venice. He spotted a pile of clothes on the shore. He began checking them to see if he could discern an owner. A small piece of paper was found tucked in one of the shoes. It read as follows. To whom it may concern, I have waited for the police to capture me for the Black Dahlia killing, but have not. I am too much of a coward to turn myself in, so this is the best way out for me. 
I couldn't help myself for that, or this. Sorry, Mary. A lifeguard at the beach was notified and immediately contacted the police. After inspecting the clothes, police could not identify their owner. The case began to go cold. The initial media frenzy was dying down. After the murder was first reported, the case held the front page for 35 days straight. In the years since the killing, no one has been definitively linked to it. One suspect that is widely pointed to is George Hill Hodel Jr. While he has never been charged, he was accused of his son, former Los Angeles homicide detective Steve Hodel. While he has never been charged, he was accused by his son, retired Los Angeles homicide detective Steve Hodel. George Hodel had in fact been a suspect in the murder of his secretary, but never faced formal charges. After being acquitted for a later rape, he allegedly fled the country and spent 40 years in the Philippines. Rumor has it that Hodel was trained as a surgeon, which would explain the almost surgical precision used in mutilating Short's body. Investigators had wiretapped his home and discovered a rather chilling exchange. George Hodel was talking to an unidentified visitor when he stated, Supposing I did kill the Black Dahlia. They couldn't prove it now. They can't talk to my secretary because she's dead. More than 60 people have confessed to being the Black Dahlia murderer. Some of these people had not even been born at the time of the killing. February 2nd, 1947. After finding out the details of the case, Republican State Assemblyman C. Don Field introduced a bill calling for the formation of a sex offender registry. California would go on to be the first state to make sex offender registration mandatory. Almost 80 years later, the case remains probably the first crime to capture the public after the conclusion of World War II. Its enduring legacy is still felt today. Rumors abounded about Elizabeth Short's personal life, but when you strip away all the conjecture, you're left with this. A young woman was brutally killed, and after all of this time, it's a case that may remain forever unsolved. So what do you think? Who killed Elizabeth Short? Was it an aspiring surgeon or perhaps a jilted lover? A modest-sized city sitting at just over 30,000 residents, Hopkinsville, Kentucky, is a quiet southern town like any other. Perhaps the strange part is the bowling balls. 60% of all bowling balls made came from Hopkinsville, until the factory making them shut down in 2019. No, things in Hopkinsville today are unassuming. The 1978 film Attack of the Killer Tomatoes stated that Hopkinsville was once besieged by millions of irate birds, but that's not true. What actually happened in Hopkinsville in Kelly, Kentucky is of keen interest to ufologists, professional debunkers, and of course, me. August 21st, 1955. Billy Ray Taylor was in Kelly visiting a friend named Lucky Sutton. Lucky, along with ten of his other family members, all lived together on the outskirts of the small town. Billy Ray was out fetching water from the backyard when he states he saw a silvery object, real bright, with an exhaust all the colors of the rainbow, pass silently over the house before abruptly stopping and dropping to the ground. He ran to tell the Suttons of what he had seen and was almost laughed out of the room. Everyone settled and continued with their night. Reports of drinking and other rabble-rousing remain unconfirmed. Eventually, the barking of the dogs out back grew annoying. Billy Ray and Lucky went to investigate and saw an eerie glow coming from the tree line. In the middle of this glow was, according to witnesses, about three and a half feet tall, it had an oversized head, almost perfectly round, arms extended almost to the ground, hands had talons, and eyes glowed with a yellowish light. The body gave off an eerie shimmer under the moon, they said, as if made of silver metal. 
Lucky and Billy Ray were in a world-changing situation. They were, according to their accounts, making contact with alien beings. What questions would they ask? What profound experiences and knowledge did these creatures have to share with humanity? What were Billy Ray and Lucky's reactions? They immediately gathered a 20 gauge shotgun and a 22 rifle and began firing indiscriminately at the creatures. They would later state that as the creature approached, it had its clawed hands up in a gesture of surrender. That didn't stop them from firing. They stated the creature did a flip and rushed back into the darkness it had come from. Panicked beyond belief, the men returned to the house to hunker down. Once inside, another of the creatures was caught peering through a side window. The duo once again opened fire and the creature once again did a flip and scurried away. It was a siege and the Suttons and Taylors were forcing a stalemate. The window screen was shredded by shot shells and 22 rounds, but no one was any closer to figuring out what was going on. Billy Ray decided to step outside briefly to size up the situation. Once there, the family reported seeing a clawed hand reach for him from the overhang above the door. They quickly pulled him back inside while Lucky opened fire on the overhang. In the distance, he spotted another one of the creatures in a tree and opened fire on it as well. Both creatures reportedly ran back into the woods. The family decided it was in their best interest to hunger down. They would sit in silence, armed and ready, for the next three hours. They listened and said they heard only occasional scratches on the roof. At 11 p.m., it was decided that it was not a skirmish they could win. All 11 of the Sutton clan, joined by Billy Ray Taylor and his wife, ran for vehicles and sped off into the night. The frazzled and panic-stricken group made it to the Hopkinsville police station. There, they explained what had happened at the farmhouse. Authorities sent a large group of officers to investigate the scene. Shell casings, along with damage to the farmhouse from bullets, were found. Reportedly, no evidence of drinking was found. The Sutton family matriarch claimed that liquor wasn't allowed in her home. After the all-clear was called, the family tried to settle in for the night. The Sutton matriarch claims that at approximately 3.30 that morning, she watched one of the creatures silently glow at her bedroom window, a clawed hand resting on the screen. She yelled for her family, and once again they opened fire. The news spread fast. It was reported on by the New York Times and other local and national news wires. People descended in droves to see where it happened. The Sutton family was sick of the attention. No trespassing signs were staked around the property, and still people came. Wary of using their alien fighting guns on gawkers, they began charging admission. Fifty cents for entering the property, a dollar for information, and ten dollars for taking pictures. The Suttons obviously didn't care for the limelight. As things quieted down around the farmhouse, history moved on past the nighttime siege of Kelly Hopkinsville, slinking further and further into the realm of modern mystery. While the claims did grab the attention of Air Force UFO Investigation Program Project Blue Book, it is widely believed that they did not investigate beyond speaking with the soldiers stationed at a nearby airbase who had been at the Sutton House briefly the night of the incident. In 1956, ufologist Isabel Davis compiled a 200-page report on the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter. Through her investigation, she ruled out everything aside of genuine alien contact. She stated that she believed the family members she spoke to were honest, sober folk. Her report remains the most comprehensive breakdown of the events of that night. Others are not so sure. Writer and skeptic Jake Slocum stated in 2008, Look at the head of the creature, then look at the head of an owl. Now, get really, really drunk. We're talking mid-1950s rural Kentucky drunk. The owl theory is one of interest to a few different researchers. UFologist Renaud Lecklet has stated that it could be a misidentification of a pair of great horned owls, which are nocturnal, fly silently, have yellow eyes, and aggressively defend their nests. I don't know if approaching with their hands up could be considered aggressive, but what do you think? Was a family attacked by a group of interstellar visitors? Or did some folks just get spooked by some owls? 
November 13th, 1974, Amityville, Long Island, Henry's Bar. A disheveled man pushed through the front door and shouted that his parents had been shot. They lived fairly close to the bar, just down the road. The man in the bar was Ronald Butch DeFeo, and what happened in the house at 112 Ocean Avenue would kick off over 50 years of speculation, multiple books, and 16 films. A few patrons inside the bar followed DeFeo back to his home. When they arrived, they found his parents shot dead in their beds. One of the members of the group called the police. When they arrived, they would go on to find all four of DeFeo's siblings dead in their beds as well. DeFeo was taken into protective custody by the police due to him claiming that he believed his family was killed by mob hitman Louis Fellini. Fellini had a strong alibi, and the police began putting pressure on DeFeo after noticing inconsistencies in his recounting of the events. Just one day after the murders, Ronald DeFeo would confess to police, admitting that, Once I started, I couldn't stop. It just went so fast. He had killed his family, hidden the evidence, taken a shower, and gone to work as if nothing was wrong. In November of 1975, despite a strong defense, which featured an insanity plea after DeFeo claimed to be acting out the orders of unseen voices, DeFeo was found guilty of six counts of second-degree murder, one for each of his family members. He was sentenced to 25 years to life in all six cases. Ronald DeFeo Jr. is a host of mysteries all on his own. He claimed to have drugged his family members before slaying them, but toxicology reports found no substances in their systems. He claimed his sister had killed the family and that he had knocked her out and shot her in self-defense. He even claimed that mysterious voices told him to kill. There has never been a concrete motive provided for the killings. Strangely enough, on the night of the killings, no gunshots were reported in the neighborhood that the DeFeos lived in. The only noise reported by neighbors was the sound of the DeFeos dog barking through the night. December 1975. George and Kathy Lutz have found a steal at $80,000. A sprawling 4,000 square foot home with its own dock and boathouse. The Lutzes soon close on the house and move in with their family. There are reports that they were never told about the gruesome history of the home. The real estate broker who showed them the house is on record saying that they told the Lutzes about DeFeo. No one can ever say for certain what happened in the following 28 days. To hear George and Kathy tell it, they were run out of the house by evil spirits. From their first day in the house, George knew something wasn't right. He talked to a friend who advised that he get the house blessed. George claims he called a priest, Father Pecoraro, to bless the home. He states that the priest was slapped and heard a disembodied voice telling him to get out. The priest would later allegedly experience a form of stigmata with blisters forming on his hands. After some time in the house, George claimed he began waking up at 3.15 every morning, the same time the DeFeo family had been murdered. The family claims to have seen green ooze coming out of the walls. Assorted bangs, bumps, and clatters were reported by the family. George claimed to have seen a pig-like creature with red eyes watching his family through the windows of the house. Through numerous retellings, the content of George Lutz's claims seems to change. In other versions of events, the priest experienced true stigmata with bleeding from the hands. Instead of cold spots, George reported feeling so cold all the time that he kept the fireplace roaring day and night. He would also claim that Kathy had transformed in front of his eyes into a 90-year-old woman. On the 28th day in the home, the family claimed they were chased up the stairs by a growing blob of green goo. They left that night, and George is quick to tell everyone that they were so scared that they even left the furniture in the house. Very few people mention that the furniture came with the house for an added $400. Tuesday, 
Two months after the Lutzes left, a group of world-renowned psychics, including future subject of her own episode of Dread the Unsolved, Lorraine Warren, slept at the house, and Warren reported a sense of horrible depression. Of all the photographs taken by the group, only one shows something that begins to defy explanation. Over time, many people have been brought to the house to investigate the Lutz's claims. In 1977, a medium who toured the house stated that it was haunted by the ghost of a Native American chief, upset because the house was built on a sacred burial ground. They even went as far as to claim that DeFeo was possessed by this chief. The Montaukett tribe of Long Island called foul, saying that there is no record of any burial site in Amityville. On the other side of the coin, Joe Nickel is a professional skeptic. He's clearly made his mind up regarding the house. He stated, the bottom line is that it was a hoax, or is simply at best a matter that's not proven. And that's not very good for America's most famous haunted house. Today, the house at 112 Ocean Avenue doesn't exist. The couple that bought the house after the bank foreclosed on the Lutzes had the address changed to avoid spiritual thrill seekers looking for their next hit of the supernatural. 108 Ocean Avenue has been inhabited by three owners since that dark 28 days in the winter of 1975. None of them have reported any strange incidents. So what do you think? Is the famous Amityville house haunted, or was it all a hoax to drum up some quick cash? Sarah Lockwood Party is born in New Haven, Connecticut. The daughter of Leonard and Sarah Party, she is, at the day of her birth, astoundingly wealthy. Leonard Party was a carriage manufacturer, and her mother was a popular figure at upper-class functions. She was a bright child and knew four languages. She would later go on to attend the Young Ladies Collegiate Institute at Yale. When Sarah became old enough to marry, her parents scanned the throngs of upper-crust suitors and settled on one William Wirt Winchester. If you didn't know, William was the only son of firearms magnate Oliver Winchester, whose mass-produced rifles helped settlers as they took root across the West. Some called the Winchester Repeating Rifle the rifle that won the West, though many companies claim that as well. Sarah and William married in 1862. Things appeared to be going well, and in 1866, Sarah gave birth to a daughter, Annie Winchester. But this is an episode of Dread the Unsolved. I unfortunately don't trade in happily ever afters. Forty days after her birth, Annie passed away due to marasmus, a condition that causes an inability to metabolize proteins. Essentially, she starved to death in one of the richest households of the 1860s. William and Sarah stayed married and continued living their lives, slightly overshadowed by the death of their daughter. In 1880, William's father Oliver died, leaving him in charge of the entire Winchester Repeating Arms Company. A year passed, and after a short and sudden bout of tuberculosis, William Winchester followed in his father's footsteps, as it were. At this point, theories vary. Some say Sarah enlisted the help of a medium in Boston, who told her she needed to atone for the deaths caused by Winchester rifles, lest she be tortured until her dying day. How to accomplish this? Move west and build a house for the souls. Other theories say she moved west to be closer to her remaining family. Whatever the reasoning, Sarah moved west to San Jose, California. She purchased an unfinished eight-bedroom farmhouse. Once again, theories differ as to how she went about what she did next. Some say she began expanding, without the help of architects, to build a home fit to house the souls of all the people killed with a Winchester rifle. Other theories say that Sarah, being preposterously rich, hired an architect and got to work alleviating her boredom by planning expansions to the house. Just as before, regardless of the theory, the house was being expanded. 
Rooms were added, architects were hired and fired. Somewhere around 1890, Sarah stopped using architects altogether. With no training and no experience, Sarah began drawing the plans for expansions herself. This led to a documented case of her accidentally designing in a safety issue. Here is a quote from Sarah in a letter to her sister. I am constantly having to make an upheaval for some reason. For instance, my upper hall which leads to the sleeping apartment was rendered so unexpectedly dark by a little addition that after a number of people had missed their footing on the stairs, I decided that safety demands something to be done. Some have stated that Sarah continued building, pushed on by spirits. Others believe that Sarah had money, and when you have enough money, you can continually make mistakes, attempt to rectify them, and then make more. In February of 1895, the San Francisco Chronicle ran a story on Sarah. This is what they had to say. The sound of the hammer is never hushed. The reason for it is in Mrs. Winchester's belief that when the house is entirely finished, she will die. Whether she had discovered the secret of eternal youth and will live as long as the building material, saws and hammers last, or is doomed to disappointment, as great as Ponce de Leon in his search for the fountain of life is a question for time to solve. The house continued construction, with rooms being added, torn down, and re-added in the span of a week. From 1886 to 1922, the house was in a constant state of flux. Its dimensions changed by the day. Some claim that Sarah needed the rooms to hide. She reportedly slept in a different room every night, lest the spirits catch up with her. When a room was not available, she'd have builders construct one on the spot. In 1922, at the age of 82, Sarah would die alone in her bedroom of heart failure. By the time the house was finished, it settled at 24,000 square feet, 10,000 windows, 2,000 doors, 160 rooms, 52 skylights, 47 stairways and fireplaces, 17 chimneys, 13 bathrooms, and 6 kitchens. It was a far cry from the life it began as an eight-bedroom farmhouse. Just over a year after her death, the house was open to the public for tours, which continues to this day. Visitors are treated to stairways to nowhere, secret doors, and the general confusing architecture that Sarah was known for. The house may have succeeded in drawing in spirits, as it's considered by many to be one of the most haunted locations in America. So what do you think? Was Sarah Winchester bored and rich? Or did the restless dead lead to a marvel of modern architecture? <laughs>